structured input. And that structured input should be uh, formulated under supervised setup. What does this mean? This means if, let us say, you want to uh, give some images where there is a cat inside that image, and you want AI uh, to understand or to classify, is there any cat in the image or not? Now, if you only collect the images and provide that to your neural network, they, it will predict something, but to rectify those predictions so that we can able to make sure that neural network with highest accuracy will predict whether there is cat in the image or not, we need to have supervised setup. That supervised setup is basically created by uh, a human expert who is annotating the labels. And these labels are something uh, one, if there is a cat in the image and zero, if there is no cat in the image. So this is the fundamental idea and the foremost requirement if you want to go with deep learning. So mostly deep learning is a supervised learning approach. It is not an unsupervised learning approach. Okay. Now, a lot of uh, people, they always uh, think and they always, uh, I mean, adopt deep learning based solutions for any type of work. But there is a reason and there should be some sound uh, I would say intuition behind applying deep learning based solutions. So when there is a problem statement given to you and you will be asked, uh, can you please tell me that do you wish to go with deep learning or machine learning or rule based approach? Then you should have some reasons so that you can make a decision across these three uh, variables. So when to go towards deep learning. So there are two things. One is if you have huge amount of data with you, then you should go with the choice of deep learning. And along with that, when you have a reasonable uh, infrastructure at your hand, like cloud or GPUs, then and then only you will go uh, towards deep learning for building your solution. So two deciding criteria. the first one, is amount of data or volume of data which is available. And second is uh, the, the infrastructure which you have. So if these two things you have, then you can, you can go with deep learning based approach. Okay. I'm not going to repeat uh, the architectures like there are a variety of uh, neural network based architectures with deep neural network, shallow neural network, recurrent neural network, long short term memory, convolutional neural network. So these are different type of uh, architectures in deep learning, which are used for different type of purposes. Like if you take standard neural network, it can be used for anything. If you use convolutional neural network, these are special purpose neural networks, which are used to process images because image is for high dimensional data and processing high dimensional data with with traditional standard neural network is computationally not viable solution. So uh, a special purpose architecture is designed, which is called as convolutional neural network. Next type of architecture, which is recurrent neural network, which basically tries to process sequential data. So you can take, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one use case where you are searching something in Google and Google is trying to predict what can be the next word or what can be the next same text when you are typing something in the uh, text box. So those type of applications you can do. So recurrent neural network is a special type of neural network which understands the sequential embeddings or sequential dependencies of the words in the sentences. Okay. So there are a couple, couple of more uh, state-of-the-art architectures in market, but since this is introductory session and uh, our focus is not that, so let us keep that part. Uh, yeah. Right. Now, the basic uh, understanding about neural network is there is a neuron, and these neurons are stacked uh, across different layers to form deep neural network. So the function which is implemented inside the neuron is basically a logistic regression. So logistic regression is an algorithm uh, which is coined in 18th century 
and we are using this logistic regression as a as a base algorithm for our neural network so every neuron in the neural network has two components one component the first half component is taking the input and then it's multiplied with weight and then some bias is added into that which gives you z the activation function uh, provides you some prediction so i think this till this point uh, the topics are covered okay but to make sure that why we want to do that because uh, all right in every neuron we are taking the input we are multiplying that with some weight we are adding some bias and after that we are uh, processing that using some non linear activation functions so there are a couple of non linear activation functions in the market like uh, sigmoid tanh relu likir relu and many more but what is use of this non linear function why we are using that so basically the intuition behind that is we are using deep learning for difficult uh, i mean on difficult problems where uh, finding some the relationship between input and output is a polynomial relationship with higher degree so there can be a degree of 10 there can be a degree of 20 and then you will form a polynomial equation so that if you feed the input to the polynomial output and then the predicted output is much much closer to the ground truth so you can imagine that the relationship between input and output is non linear and to suffice that requirement we are using these different non linear activation functions okay so that's the that's the purpose of using non linear activation what is the purpose of weights and bias because if you see the first half of the neuron we what we are basically doing is we are multiplying the the identity value of the input which is x with some w which is nothing but weight so these weights are initialized with some mechanism and that value of weight is very very small so uh, if you ask me about what is the deep learning or how deep learning is uh, capable of understanding complex relationships between input and output it is through finding those weight matrices okay so we call that Term as a Jacobian matrix. So the fundamental idea of training a deep learning to find Jacobian matrix, and that Jacobian matrix, if we applied onto uh, identity value of an input, which is nothing but x, x1, x2, whatever those values are, then we will apply the weights in the Jacobian matrix onto those input values such that it will give us the classification or regression as output. so the purpose is to find the best value of w so that it will help us to to filter some portion from the x let us say value of x is 1 for example okay and then we are applying uh, a weight which is randomly initialized to 0.2 so when i implement 0.2 with 1 the output is 0.2 which means that the amount of of information which i am extracting from the identity function which is x is 20% and if let us say you are giving an input which is a cat image and uh, you want deep learning to understand uh, whether there is cat in the image or not so at the time of training what deep learning is doing is it is changing the values of those weights such that Uh, it will find the best combination of weights which if applied onto a image uh, there will be higher weights assigned to the portion where there is a cat and uh, uh, negligible value or smaller values of weights are assigned to the portion where there is no cat so this type of uh, distribution of weights if you want to understand manually it's not possible but using this uh, deep neural networks it's possible okay and then once you randomly initialize these weights initially since it is random 
you want to rectify or you want to modify these weights such that the, the predicted value will be much, much closer to the ground truth. So always ground truth is represented as one. If there is a ground truth, and if there is absence of ground truth, we manually annotate that value as a zero. So when your neural network, after training, provides some prediction, you will get that predicted probability, and then you will compare, is that probability uh, closer to the ground truth? Let us say, for example, that ground truth is one, and your probability prediction is 0 0.3. So there is huge difference between 0 0.3 and 1. So you need something at the end. That something is nothing but your cost function. So you can use, uh, I mean, uh, negative log, and then you will calculate a sigmoid loss function, which will help you to, to calculate the difference between prediction and the actual, right? So uh, once you calculate that loss, for every sample which you are feeding to your neural network, you will sum that loss across all the samples in your training data, which results into your cost function. So that final cost, you are setting the objective, statistical point of view, to minimize that cost function. So if you want to minimize that cost function, which is nothing but the, uh, you can say how much your neural network deviates from the ground truth, okay? So that is your cost function. And then what you will do is you will back propagate that value of the cost function. And then at every neuron, you are calculating the derivative that how much each weight in each layer contributes towards uh, a loss function. So partial derivative of loss with respect to uh, the weight, okay? So fundamentally, internally what is happening is Internally, when you are back propagating that loss, we are calculating the impact of each W in each layer and in each neuron on the loss. Those who are impacting a lot, they will be modified a lot. Those who are impacting less, they will be modified less. This is what the derivative. And then uh, the whole process will be, will be conducted many times. And then somewhere, after some number of epochs, you will reach to uh, ninety percent or ninety five percent accuracy, and beyond that, the increase in the accuracy is not possible. Okay, so so the basic idea is this one that we are we have introduced logistic regression uh, so that uh, the nonlinearities uh, or the nonlinear relationship between input and output can be captured using uh, deep neural network. Now there are. Uh, many activation functions, non-linear activation functions available in market. Uh, I hope uh, this, this is covered uh, previously, but uh, the choice of these non-linear activation function is very much crucial when you practice uh, these deep neural networks uh, in, on real-time projects or on your PhD work or let us say in industry. So when you take sigmoid, mostly sigmoid is used in first few early layers and last layer. If you take tan H, basically tan H comes uh, somewhere near to the last few layers and really occupy the whole space from start to the end. So somewhere in the middle of the neural network. Okay. So how come these positioning of these nonlinear activation functions are decided? It comes from the practice. People try to randomly place these different nonlinear activation functions. And uh, uh, somehow they understood that if they position the, uh, the uh, nonlinear activation functions in this way, then they are getting uh, better convergence. Okay. Now the question is, why we want to use nonlinear activation? As I said, the first reason is we want to understand the nonlinearity association between input and output. And the second most important reason, when you look into the, uh, the stepwise operations which are, which are executed from the, from the first layer, from the source layer to the, to the final layer, to the output layer, you will see that in every neuron, we are performing two functions, three functions. The first top of neuron is multiplication and addition. 
that is w into x plus p. So there is one multiplication and one addition. And in the same neuron, the, the, the next half is uh, you are applying sigmoid onto that z, right? Now, when in every neuron, we are performing multiplication of some non-negative floating weight value with some uh, integer data, okay, which is nothing but your input value. In every neuron, the multiplication scales your value exponentially because multiplication is uh, doubling something, right? So the, the, the factor of that doubling depends on uh, by which using which number you are multiplying that value. So you will use five, then it, it, it gets scaled five times. So there is an exponential scale in the value. So if you don't use these nonlinear activation functions, what will happen is when you are propagating that uh, multiplied input from one layer to the next layer, and in every layer, it is scaled exponentially, it, there is high chance that the value of the, uh, uh, the output of the multiplication will be uh, the huge number which these traditional architectures like one human architectures are, I mean, the, the, the traditional systems cannot be able to store because you can see that 64 bit systems, operating systems are there. So how much data these 64 bit operating systems can hold is two raised to 64. So if you imagine that you are stacking 100 layers one after the other, and in every layer, what is happening internally is multiplication, which is scaling it exponentially. Till 50th layer, you will come up with such a huge number which you cannot able to store. So it is needed to compress that number without losing the information between zero and one. And that's the basic aim of using an activation function. The next important thing is how we are initializing the weights and biases. So the most important thing uh, is weight as far as uh, you can say uh, deep learning is concerned, okay? Because the better you initialize the weights, uh, there is high chance that you will converge uh, in minimum number of epochs or minimum number of training cycles. Now, is there any way to, to decide how to initialize the weights? Uh, Yes, there are weights, but those weights will not alleviate the, the requirement of uh, training. So you need to initialize the weights with some understanding. So the first and uh, more, most abstract way of initializing the weights is using some random sampling or some random initializers. And then you can give some uh, limits that what should be uh, the value of the weight. So you can give the limit as the weight should be between 0 to 0.5. So when you uh, execute a random initializer, so for every entry of the weight, it will randomly sample the value between 0 and 0.5. Now, almost uh, we are on track. So we initialize these weights and then we started training. I mean, the training is something we, we multiplied those weights on the, on the uh, input layer. Okay, so you can understand that if I am initializing these weights to let us say one, whatever is there, whatever is the input, I mean x1, the whole input I'm going to propagate towards output. If I initialize the value to 0 0.10 times 0, 01, then the negligible portion of that x is going to get filtered towards the output. Okay, so the so the so the fact is better we initialize the value, uh, there is a chance that we will converge it uh, in early number of cycles. So how to do that? So when we randomly initialize, and if there are many, many number of uh, deep layers in your neural network, there can be a chance of exploding gradient, or there can be a chance of vanishing gradient. So if you initialize the values, I mean, you are giving a range between 0 to 0.5. And since there is a random sampling, let's say 80% of the weights are randomly sampled 
which are closer to the point five. Okay, so in that situation, your weight values are. I mean, uh, the magnitude of that weight is uh, is huge. 0 0.4, 0 0.45, 0 0.39, something like that. So that quantity is a huge, which allows deep neural network to extract huge quantity from the input layer. So when you are forwarding huge quantity from the first layer itself, and in each layer, when you are multiplying that quantity with some W, uh, there is high chance that towards higher layers, the magnitude of the value which is extracted from the earlier layers is huge, which results into, uh, uh, I mean, results into, you can say a derivative equals to one. So uh, when you got a huge value, which tends to get closer to one, so when you calculate a derivative, right? Uh, so derivative with respect to one uh, is zero, and derivative with respect to very, very small value is one, right? So uh, you can imagine that the huge value which you are taking, when you calculate the, the derivative, the, the graph or the, you can say, uh, the plot is almost horizontal. So there is no information available. So that is called as vanishing gradient problem. And if you initialize the weights, a very, very small value, which is extracting a small portion of input from the input layer, and uh, when you calculate the derivative of the weights with respect to these very, very small numbers, it tends to approximately equal to zero. And uh, uh, no, it, it tends to approximately, approximately equals to one because the weights are also small and the, the value which is extracted is also small. So numerator and denominator are uh, approximately same, which, which gives you uh, a result, which is, which is one, right? So uh, mostly what will happen is when your derivative is one, uh, you, will, you will try to modify those weights onto larger front, right? So somehow the convergence will not be better. So there are, to solve this particular uh, problem, there are weight initialization strategies available in the market like uh, HE initialization. So when you use HE initialization, what it does is, it takes the, the, the weights, the dimensions of the weights in the, in the next layer and the dimensions of the weights in the current layer. And then you will divide that two vector, the multiplication of these two vectors with square root of two, right? So that is the HE initialization. Uh, sorry, the numerator is at, uh, I mean, the numerator will be square root of two and the denominator will be mod of W1 and W2 the multiplication of both, ones, both the magnitudes. So a couple of strategies are available. The intuition of using these better initialization strategies is to come out from, uh, uh, you can say, uh, vanishing gradient problem and uh, you can say uh, the exploding gradient problem. So these two problems are there and to avoid that, we, we supposed to initialize the weights uh, at uh, better well, is there any way to initialize the weight? Uh, the bias, initially bias tends to zero. So it is the standard practice to initialize biases to zero. And then uh, what you can do is slowly, uh, you will add the derivative of uh, uh, the partial derivative of bias, bias with respect to weight into the zero. And then slowly the value of bias will get changed as you uh, train your neural network to the next. So these are some of the internal findings as a, as an architect of the solution or as a researcher of the solution, you should know why rather than what to use. Just know that deep neural network is somewhere uh, becoming popular and popular and everyone wants to learn deep neural network. Everyone knows what is activation function. Everyone knows what is hidden layer, input layer, and output layer. But rarely people understand that if this is the, the, the science or this is the, the inner working of neural network, and this is the reason because of which uh, we need to go and make changes in weights and biases and make 
changes in the nonlinear activation functions, then and then only you can able to uh, provide optimal solutions. Yeah. Uh, so it's fine that uh, we understood deep neural network, and then somehow uh, you will be asked to use this deep neural network as a solution for your problem in hand. And let us say you do not have uh, data, or you have just uh, 10,000 uh, images. For example, image we will take as an unstructured data, and these 10,000 images are available. So do you wish to use deep neural network as a solution? Answer to that is no. The reason being, with very small amount of data, or small number of samples at hand, you cannot give enough opportunity to your neural network to understand the non-linearities across the data samples. Right. So deep neural networks are very, very data heavy, first thing. And second thing is you cannot run your deep neural network, let us say having a 10 deep neural network, it means skipping the output layer, uh, skipping the input layer, there will be 10 layers in your neural network, okay? So, and in each layer, you can uh, place around, let us say, 20 to 50 neurons. And you wish to run this architecture on a machine or on your laptop. Uh, what is the possibility that it will do the task uh, in polynomial time. So polynomial time is just, you can say, in half an hour, for example. So it's not possible. So it needs a huge amount of uh, computational power. So these type of tasks, you should be able to run on uh, the cloud infrastructure or even on, uh, you can say, GPUs, right? So this is the second requirement. Third requirement, you cannot provide inputs uh, as is to the deep neural network. So you need to vectorize the, the inputs. So if you say that there is an image X and there is a girl in that image, let us take this example. Now, can you uh, feed that image as it is to the, the deep neural network for processing? Answer to that is no. You need to vectorize that because the image which is shown as a human, I have that ability to see the image, okay? But how computers see that image is the collection of pixel values, okay? And this collection of pixel value is not one dimensional vector, but it is a two dimensional vector because you can have X and Y dimension of the image. And if the image is RGB, then there will be a third dimension, which is nothing but number of channels, which is nothing but red, green, and blue. So the, the first requirement is we need to pre-process the data. So how to pre-process the data is take each row and stack it vertically. Okay, so what I will do is I will uh, first read the image using image package in the Python. So which will give me a grid, let's say 64 by 64 is the image. And if it is color, it is 64 by 64 by three, right? So how many pixels will be there? It will be 64 by 64 by three. So that sums to around 12,288, okay? So this will be the multi, I mean, the total number of pixels available in the image. So you cannot, feed this 64 by, by 3 as is to your neural network, what you're supposed to do is first vectorize that. So vectorization means what? Is you are converging a high dimensional representation into low dimensional representation, mostly n by 1, where n represents 12,288 for this example, and 1 is nothing but your column. Now, uh, so how, what you will do is you will apply some pre-processing and in that pre-processing, you will write some code. 
So that code will take first row and then stack that vertically. So 64, first 64 uh, pixels in the first row and you will align that vertically. Then you have second row and you will place that second row below the first column. Okay, try to understand what I'm saying. So you are stacking each row vertically one after the other. This happens for first, uh, first channel R. Then you will do that for G. Then you will do that for B. So this is R, G, and B in one single columnar vector. And the, the dimension of that columnar vector will be 12,280 by one. Okay. And then that, so each entry in that vector is nothing but your X, which is nothing but the feature which you want to give to your deep neural network. Consuming that, deep neural network will try to understand uh, the, the image. Okay. Now, if you see, so, so fundamentally, when the image is given to you in this three-dimensional form, uh, image data, images are basically, they maintain spatial association. So what is spatial association? Spatial association is uh, if there are hairs on the head, below head, there will be eyebrows, then there will be uh, eyes, then middle, there will be a nose, below nose, there will be mouth, and some, so these are the traits, okay? So uh, this is called as spatial association. So the distance between uh, ear and nose makes some sense if we want to uh, understand or if you want to recognize that that object as a as a person isn't it so these are the special associations which are strongly maintained in the image so if you see as a result of vectorization these special associations are fully relaxed i mean when you are taking the first row and stacking it vertically when you are taking the second row and when you are stacking it vertically below the first one, the associations of these features gets diluted, okay? And then that vector you are passing as is to the neural network. So, uh, so let me give you one interesting fact that you can create an image where uh, there will be a person. Okay, and then again, you can try to uh, exchange some portions from that uh, person's body uh, randomly anywhere in the image. So there are two images. One is the image of the person without alteration. And the second is the image of the person where different portions of that images you change. So nose will be at the corner, uh, head will be somewhere at the at the bottom and something like that. Okay. And then you give the first image to deep neural network. Deep neural understand that yes, there is a person in the image. If you give the second image where you alter or exchange these different traits and the association of these features is not maintained, okay, it is diluted. And if you feed that image to deep neural network, uh, you will get something, uh, I mean, unexpected. Still, your deep neural network will recognize that there is a person. How come this? This is because deep neural network understands the distributions and not the semantics. So in statistics, there is one separate branch which is called as frequentiest analysis. So in frequentiest analysis, what we basically try to do is we we want to understand the probability distribution of each and every value for a given class. And uh, for every class, let's say class, there is a cat, there is a person, there is a chair, there is a, uh, there is a dog, right? For every class, there is some distribution of values which represents that class. And what Deep Neural Network tries to understand is the probability distribution of those values with respect to the classes. 
and it is not capable of understanding the semantic associations. So if you take the head and if you place that, if you mark that head and place that uh, as your legs and you keep mark your legs and keep uh, on your shoulder, still it will remember and it will recognize that as a person, which is a serious, uh, I would say, flaw in the existing deep neural network. Uh, people are blindly, uh, or since they don't know too much about uh, this, they, they think that uh, now there is something called as AI and 90% of AI approaches are deep neural networks. It is going to solve any NP hard problem, right? But that's not true. There are some limitations uh, because of which adopting deep neural network as a solution to every problem is something uh, not possible. So that is one of the one of the deficiency in in the uh, learning which deep neural networks has. If you would like to take this as your PhD topic, you are welcome. Try to find some maths which will try to uh, link those associations with some weights, weights, and if those associations are below some below these weights, you will not recognize that as a as a person. So different thoughts are there around that. Fine. Then the next thing about uh, deep neural network is the hyperparameters. So people a uh, lot many times they make uh, made some confusion between parameters and hyperparameters. So when we speak about hyperparameter, and when we speak about parameter, there is a fundamental idea behind that. So something which change or affects the value of the output is parameter. And something which don't change or uh, you can say don't affect the value of the output, then all those variables are called as hyperparameters. So what is hyperparameter? So learning rate is a hyperparameter. Okay. So when you will try to understand what is learning rate, you need to understand what is gradient descent. Okay. So gradient descent is basically a, a way in calculus which provides you a direction. And when you move in the negative direction, the direction which is given by gradient descent, you will reach to the local minima or global minima without exploring the whole solution space. I know that I'm using very, very difficult words, but this is the exact answer to that. Okay, so, uh, so let me give you one example so you will understand that. Uh, yeah, so let us say you are moving around uh, some hilly area and uh, uh, you throw a ball, right? So the ball will follow a direction where it will see steepest curve, okay? And then it will rest somewhere where that curve is horizontal. Now, when we draw a solution space, basically there will be uh, too many, uh, uh, you can say, peak points and too many valleys. And in stats, these peak points are considered as, so if you draw this graph where your y-axis is cost, right? And x-axis is number of training cycles. Your objective function is when you are training your neural network, you basically wants to avoid those peaks because they are representing huge cost. And you basically wants to go to those uh, value locations, right, where the, the cost is minimum, right? And cost, we know that it is difference between your prediction and the actual. So how to do that? Because if you go with greedy approach, uh, so greedy approach tends to see that every sub-solution in the given solution space should be tested and should be ranked as per the value. And then you will rank those in the ascending order 
and you will pick the first entry in that rank, which is nothing but the, the subsample for which you got the list cost. Now, these problems are not simple problems. That's why we are using deep neural network. Okay. Since your solution space is huge enough in n dimensions, you can imagine that how many subsamples are available in that solution space is let's say 10,000, which is a small. Practically, it should be in millions and billions. But for the sake of academic understanding, I'm keeping that to let us say 10,000. Now, I want to sort these all samples, subsolutions uh, in, in ascending order, right? So to sort it in ascending order, what I need to do is I need to pick the one first, and then I need to make n minus one comparisons. Then I will pick two, then I will make n minus two comparisons. Then I will pick three, and then I will make n minus four comparisons. So when you will take this chain, and when you want to normalize that, it equals to n factorial. Okay, so n factorial, if let us say you have n equals to 10,000, which is a very, very small number, okay? I mean, 10,000 solutions you have, and out of these 10,000 solutions, you want to pick the one which is best, it's the objective function. Then 10,000 factorial will be your solution space. Of this total number of combinations you will have at hand. And then from all these, 10,000 factorial combinations, you will pick the combination where the first entry will be the list and the last entry will be the max. Imagine even today supercomputers are failing at processing 1,000 factorial and processing 10,000 factorial is still in the imagination and probably that, that should Microsoft, IBM, they are uh, pouring a lot of money in incubating quantum computers. Okay, so this is also a flaw in deep neural networks. So fundamentally, it's not possible. So what is possible is just use one approach, which is called as gradient descent, which for every back propagation, it will provide you some intuition about the direction, which if followed, most probably you will get better accuracy than the one which you got previously. Okay, that too, without ultra, without uh, I will say visiting every solution in the solution space. Okay, so yeah, so that's the purpose of using uh, the gradient descent. Uh, see, if I I went deeper and deeper in, in these all things. No? Uh, there are a lot of questions, a uh, lot many questions you will have, but let, let me give you some fair idea uh, at, at a very abstract level. Still, I'm not discussing these all things in detail. Okay, so this is a gradient descent. So let us say when you pick your weights randomly, what happens is with that weight, you will get some prediction right and then uh, uh, you will calculate the cost function which is nothing but difference between your ground truth and the prediction and then that you will plot so that cost you will plot onto this xy plane where your y is basically uh, a cost and your x is basically the number of training cycles now that point gets located randomly on that xy plane somewhere and uh, your objective function is to go uh, to near to the x-axis where the value of y is near to zero, okay? So you can imagine a hyperbola, okay? Somewhere you are at uh, some point where y is 0.8, I mean, the cost is 0.8, and you want to go to the point uh, where your y is 0.1, I mean, the cost is 0.1. Now, you are at that point 0.8 position, but you don't know how to go to that point 0.1. Uh, 
right? So in every batch propagation, for initial few thousand number of cycles, deep neural network internally it randomly try different weights. It's go on trying different weights. This weight combination, this weight combination, this weight combination, this weight combination. Somewhere when it tends to use the number of combinations and along that path it tries to understand one hypothesis okay and that hypothesis is if i am making the changes in these weights and if i am increasing some weights and decreasing some weights it has positive impact on the error right it means my error is reducing so 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 that's the direction you got internally with the gradient descent and then that gradient descent allows you to follow the same hypothesis may not be true after a couple of number of training cycles but it will remain true to some extent right and then you will exchange your uh, hypothesis and then these sequences of different hypotheses leads you from the pointed position to a point one position on the given x y dimensional plane okay now so when you want to move from that pointed position to point one position uh, you will you will you can take a step size uh, let us say uh, you will move by 0 0.1 0 0.1 0 0.1 0 0.1 so it will take huge amount of time right so you need to decide some uh, some threshold such that you will compare the previous cost function and current cost function. And if the current cost function is lesser than the previous cost function, you will try to follow the same hypothesis, which allows you to get the current cost function. Now, after how much, after how much time you want to do this assessment? This is nothing but your learning. So, uh, learning rate basically in industry, what we do is we use adaptive learning rate based policy where we calculate the, and if that gradient is very, then learning rate is very, very small. And if that gradient tends to near the zero, then we increase the learning rate. So you can imagine the situation that if the curve is steepest, then please take small step because if you take big step, there is a chance that you will fail. And when you go, when you came to somewhere, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 50 degree or 60 degree or 70 degree uh, uh, plane, it's somewhere almost near to the horizontal. You can take bigger step sizes to reach to the, the global minimum, right? So this, this is the whole thing which is implemented when we decide the learning rate. Now, the second hyperparameter is the iterations, okay? So uh, the number of iterations is how many number of times you want to train uh, your neural network. Hidden layers is nothing but how many number of layers you are stacking in between. Hidden units in each layer, how many number of neurons you are placing. Choice of activation function, again, you know, these activation functions. Then momentum is, again, one more concept, which adds uh, pace to uh, your flow. So uh, basically, you want to reach to the global minima on that XY plane. So how fastly you can go towards that, okay? So in the existing maths, when we, when we devise gradient descent, there is no alpha factor available, which adds some magnitude, which increases the pace or speed uh, of the step size, okay? So that uh, alpha factor, which introduces speed into the gradient descent will make you the momentum. So if you increase the momentum, it, it helps you to, uh, I mean, uh, reach to the global minimum in, uh, in minimum time. Okay, so that's the momentum. Next hyperparameter is mini batch size. So 
Yeah, so, uh, yes. So batch normalization is one of the idea which subsequently introduced when people started facing problems of overfitting, okay? So I don't know whether you are aware with overfitting or underfitting uh, these ideas. I mean, high variance, uh, high bias, low variance, and low bias, okay? These are some of the ideas which, which basically as an architect of the solution helps you to understand where what is going wrong. So when there is a high variance, it means my uh, architecture is not generalizing well. So you, you, you are having better accuracy on your training data and uh, you are not getting that much of accuracy on the test data. So it fails to uh, achieve the same accuracy. That's called as high variance. And high bias is a case where at the training time only, uh, you, you don't get better accuracy. That's the high bias. So mini batch size, so what should be the size of your batch is also a hyperparameter, which basically helps you to avoid the case of high variance. So if you avoid that case, your model will generalize well on the test data. Okay, so this is one, one idea behind mini match. Second idea is, let's say you are, you are having a training data and uh, let's say uh, the number of training samples is 10,000. So when you are going to calculate the cost function, so for every sample, you are calculating the cost, the, I will say, the error, and then sum of all those losses across 10,000, if I take average across those 10,000 samples, it is a cost function. So fundamentally what I'm doing is I'm calculating the cost function for the whole training data set. And then that cost function I'm providing as an input to the back propagation. And back propagation is a, is a process where we are trying to modify the weights such that it will help us to minimize the difference between uh, prediction and uh, the ground truth. That's the, that's the reason behind that. You can imagine that for every 10,000, you are doing that. What if you do that for every 100? It gives more number of chances to your deep neural network to modify itself for a single iteration of training cycle. It means 10,000 divided by 100 is 100. So the number of times you are going to modify the weights is 100 just for one single feed of the training data, where earlier it was only once. Imagine a situation that uh, it, it basically helps the neural network to make the modifications in the weights a lot many times, and uh, that gives neural network uh, more number of opportunities to tune itself with the variances which distributed across the sample space in the given data, right? So that's what the uh, mini batch gradient is. Now there are a lot of problems because it's not that much simple that we are just keeping the, the batch size to 100 and then we are giving more opportunities to tune on the deep neural network. What if the distribution of uh, these different batches differ or they are different than one another? So if the distribution of these samples which are present in every 100 uh, uh, size batch, if, it, if they are different, then it provides shaky behavior to uh, your neural network. I mean, you, again, you will imagine a graph where y is cost and uh, the, the x is number of training cycles. So 
when you plot a behavioral graph in this situation, it will be a zigzag manner, full zigzag. And you will not see any smoothened behavior of that curve. And the more the zigzag way, uh, the more time it will take to reach to the local minimum. So, uh, so the first solution to that is you can, rather than picking the batches sequentially, first 100, like 1 to 100, 101 to 200, 201 to 300, rather than doing that, you can apply random sampling without replacement. And then you can pick those 100, 100, 100 ka batch, and then you can feed. To some extent, you can avoid that zigzag manner, but uh, not uh, fully. Uh, you can you can resolve that. And then, uh, right. So if you want to uh, get rid of this particular situation, what you can do is when you are defining. Uh, uh, deep neural network architecture, you can define a batch, normal, batch normalization layer uh, after uh, odd number of uh, uh, hidden layers so that that the batch normalization layer basically applies normalization and standardization using which uh, it transforms the, the subspace uh, such that if you calculate that distribution, it will result into zero mean and unit standard deviation. Okay, right. So, so that helps you to relax those uh, discrepancies across the distributions of the batches. And then most probably you will converge well uh, when you are plotting the graph uh, cost versus number of training points. And the last one is the regularization, which is the most important hyperparameter. So there are L1 regularization, L2 regularization, and many more. But most popular is L2 regularization. So, so yes. So what is L1 and L2? So when you take a single norm, of, uh, it is uh, L1 regularization. And when you take squared norm of a weight, it is L2 regularization. So when you take L1 regularization, it, it basically calculates the derivative only once. And when you take L2 regularization, it calculates double derivative. I mean, uh, the prime one derivative, partial derivative of let's say y hat with respect to uh, w, and then partial derivative of W prime with respect to W double prime. So, so uh, rather than getting into maths, let me tell you what is happening is when you calculate the derivative, L1 derivative, there is a high chance that the resultant Jacobian matrix, the weight matrix will, will be more sparse because uh, L1 tends to create the values of the weights, which are much closer to the, to the zero value, hence sparser matrix. But uh, L2 regularization, don't do that. It will not push the values of the derivatives too much closer to zero. Hence, the matrix will not be sparse. It will be more denser. And then this denser matrix will help you to get the, the values or to filter the values from the input and feed those values to the, to the hidden layers in between. And hence, it will result into better generalization, okay? So this is also a hyperparameter which you need to tune. Now, who is going to do that? So this is the task of a data scientist because in deep neural network, in machine learning, these models are doing their learning on their own. So uh, if you see today's market, data scientists, ML leaders, they are the, these are the positions which are highly paid. Okay, so why organizations, organizations are paying it? Uh, I mean, 
comparatively high uh, if we compare in the market to other clinicians it is because those are the people who know the intricacies of uh, tuning the hyperparameters setting up the environment and uh, optimizing the, the the training processes and uh, all the other things okay so these are the hyperparameters and this is the only task which humans do the rest of the things are done by our deep neural network okay. all right now as we understand this it's very important to set up your ml app for dlm so uh, there is a difference in machine learning and deep learning so that difference is let us say you are given with uh, 10000 uh, samples okay and you have used a decision tree or let us say support with a machine as your machine learning algorithm to process that to perform classification or regression okay now so there should be one decision about how i am going to partition the data set so there will be three things one is training one is development and third is test okay so uh training partition is used to train the the model then uh the development data set is used to evaluate the model and the test data set is used to test the data test the model now what is meaning of this so when i am using the word evaluate what i am trying to say is i want to check whether my model learned something in the training and what is the extent of that learning if the extent of that learning is very very poor then i should again retrain my model okay then again i will train that model on some more number of data samples and again i will go to the development side so basically what i am doing is i am evaluating the learning and once i got enough accuracy on evaluation i am going to test that model so uh so if it is traditional machine learning what you can do is 6000 samples you can if for training 2000 for dev, uh, development and 2000 for testing what if i am going to use deep learning should i follow the same distribution answer to that is no the distribution should be around 98% into training 1% into development and 1% into test now the question is why first answer to this question is because your deep neural network architecture is data hungry and you are not allowing that neural network to learn a lot if you keep the distribution 60% but when you keep it 98% you get enough opportunity to learn and 1% for i mean uh, 1% of the 10000 is still 100 so 100 though it looks small but it's enough for evaluating and 100 is uh good for testing and remaining 9800 is used for training okay if this is uh let us not take 10000 as example let us take 1 million as example in this case i will keep distribution to 98 1 and 1 and uh, if i have 10000 then i will keep this distribution to 80 15 and 5 So it's totally. Uh, I mean, this is a factor based on how many number of examples you have to train. Okay, so this is one thing which makes the difference between classical ML and deep neural network. Second important thing is we need to understand what is bias and variance. Because uh, bias, in standard term, is a situation when 
model did not understand or learn anything enough from the training data set is a high bias. High variance is model learned so much from the training data set that it looks like model remembered everything is high variance, which we call as overfitting. And what is the just right condition is something which is shown in the graph, the middle one. Okay. So that function is uh, not straight and not too much nonlinear, but something in between, which partitions enough number of samples into their own classes. Okay, so this is just right. Number point of view, when we want to understand that how to classify a particular situation into a given uh, uh, case, statistic example that in training, you got 1% error and in test, you got 11% error. It means model is not able to apply the knowledge which it learned in the training into test, right? It means model is overfitted, which is nothing but high variance. If you have 15% error in train, for example, and 16% error in test, there is high bias because error is high in the train, right? But it will not be high variance because the difference between Train error and test error is very, very small. It means that model is generalizing well. If you got train error 15% and test error 30%, training error is high, that's the high bias. Difference between train and test error is high, that's why it is high bias. So both are there. Okay. And let us say if you got 0.5 training error and 1% test error, then that, that will be a situation which we would like to expect that we should, we want this, this condition as achievable condition, right? So how you will check? So when you train your deep neural network, you will first check whether it results into high bias. If answer to that is yes, then the solution is increase the number of uh, samples in your training data set so that your model will receive enough knowledge and enough information so that that bias condition will be resolved. If high bias case is resolved, then you will go for high variance. So if there is a case of high variance, then what you will do is you will try to basically apply some strategies like hyperparameter tuning, uh, giving more data in the training, then uh, applying some uh, regularization techniques. And then if nothing is working with these existing approaches, you will all together use some different architecture, which will resolve the high variance case. And if answer to both, that is high variance and uh, high bias, if uh, you, you got answer to these two questions as no, then you are done. I mean, you come up with a model which generalizes well and uh, which uh, learns mostly uh, enough inference from the training data, okay? This is how you can set up your uh, deep neural network application. Now, there are two things. Let us say you are at high, high variance case. So how to reduce or avoid this case of high variance. High variance popularly called as, uh, uh, high variance is popularly called as overfitting, okay? And high bias popularly called as underfitting. So how to prevent this fitting condition? So there are a couple of techniques. The first technique is regularization. Second technique is dropout. Third technique is data augmentation. And fourth technique is early stopping. So the first technique is L2 regularization, where you will see that what we did is we added the 
squared norm of weight. So you can see that uh, the cost function j of w comma b is equals to one by m sum over one to m uh, y log y hat plus one minus y log one minus y hat. This is the sigmoid error. I mean, the loss y hat comma y is when I expand, it looks like one by m summation over all m one uh, y log y hat plus one minus y log one minus y hat. So this is the sigmoid cost function. And then into that cost function, we are adding uh, lambda divided by 2m, uh, the square norm of the weights. Okay. So what it basically does is it normalizes the, the fluctuations in the values of the weights, which linearizes the inference channel, which gets established between input and output. So internally, uh, when you see, when you plot how uh, the branches or the neurons gets activated when you place this extra factor of regularization into the cost function, you will see more of a linear flow of the information from input to output. So, so it basically uh, do, uh, I mean, uh, it smoothened the, the way weights are changing as per the, the back propagation derivative, which is supplied to it. But that's how uh, we are using uh, this regularization. And uh, since we are, we are somehow converging the nonlinear flow into more linear flow, it reduces the, the idea of poor, I mean, it reduces the idea of high variance, right? And it converges that uh, too much complex function into more linear function, uh, which helps to, to regularize the, the overfitting condition. This is the first idea. The second idea or the second solution, which is more simple, that solution is using dropout. So, so, so the dropout, what it says, it says that randomly switch off some of the neurons in each uh, hidden layer. So what does that mean? So let's say if I keep dropout equals 2.2, it means keep 80% neurons on and shut down 20% neurons in each hidden layer back to randomly. Okay, so for every uh, epoch, this dropout will be activated where these neurons are uh, I mean, shut down randomly. Okay, so now if someone wants to understand how it will help to reduce the overfitting condition, so you can imagine that there is one X1 and there are five layers, only X1 I'm saying in, in the input layer, and in these five hidden layers, there are five, five uh, neurons. So that X1 gets propagated through every neuron in the first layer to every other neuron in the second layer. So how many different ways are there using which X1 in the input layer is propagating uh, to the output? So you can imagine phi u, phi u, phi u, phi u. So there will be 20 neurons, and again, this one neuron, which is phi, so 20 factorial plus phi. And again, for the output, it's one, uh, one output layer, one single neuron, right? So it will be 10. So 20 factorial plus 10 will be the total number of paths which are available to you, using which that x is propagated from input layer to the output layer, okay? Something amazing. So if you have these many number of choices available, obviously there is a chance that you, you are learning a lot, which tends to be, tends to looks like you are remembering everything. Okay. So to avoid that, what you are doing is you are switched down uh, the, the neurons randomly. 
that number should not be very, very high. It should be max to max 20%. Starting from 5% to 20%, you can save that number to any number. So uh, it will try to reduce those number of channels or the paths, activated paths from input to output. We will get only few paths. And the second thing is the number of times your value of X is processed which is introducing the non-linearity because once it is processed, you are applying non-linear activation function onto that. By switching down those neurons, you are reducing those non-linearities. So that is also one extra advantage you will have when you want to go with the drop. This is safe, right? So indirectly, when you look into this particular case, it looks more linear. Uh, by fashion. Okay. This you can do using dropout, but make sure that when you are using batch normalization or uh, when you are using uh, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so when you are using batch normalization, make sure that dropout should not be used or vice versa. Okay. So this is one more thing. The second way of Preventing overfitting is using data augmentation. Now, why there is uh, overfitting? Because my model did not generalize well on the test data. The one of the reason might be the distribution of the test data with the trend data does not match. So, if it is not matching, I should make sure that. I am creating enough samples in the training data which helps me to match the distribution in the test data. Okay, so that you can do by assuming this case, you can use data augmentation as a technique where you can take a single image in the training data and you can apply different type of transformations, scaling, alterations on the image so that multiple number of samples from one single image you can create. And that adds enough variance in your training data. That can be done using data augmentation. Okay, so uh, this is also one of the effective techniques. Mostly people follow this data augmentation technique as a uh, de facto standard uh, when they work on the, the convolutional neural network or image technique. That is one. And uh, the third, or the I mean, not third, the fourth one is early stopping. Now, if you see the graph, you can see that there is a y axis and there is an x axis. And uh, what you are doing is you are basically recording the cost function for every iteration. All right. So when you will see that uh, in every iteration, you are Recording the cost function. So there are two lines, two functions. One is red and one is black. So when you see the black function, there the training error is basically reducing. Okay, as you increase the number of iterations, the training error gets reduced. And when you plot the development error, okay, uh, so that development error after some number of iterations is increasing. Now what is overfitting is your model is not generalizing well. It means there is a difference, high difference between trend and test or development uh, error. Okay. So what you can do is you can plot this graph and for every thing of trend and evaluation, okay, you are calculating the difference. And you will find some point where the difference between these two errors started increasing. And that point, you will stop your training. So that difference between training error I would say over fitting condition. Okay. So this is something uh, you can use to optimize the performance of your neural network. It's very important to
to understand these techniques rather than knowing uh, the deep neural networks, how to train and all basic terminologies available in the deep neural. Okay. Uh, had one and a half hour done. So if you have any questions, Chaya Madam, we go ahead uh, and ask the questions in between or should we take the question at the end? I think she's on mute. Uh, participants, what you are expecting? Should we take the questions at the end or should we take the questions in between? Chat. I don't know if she's attending or not. <laughs> Okay, all right. So uh, let us take the the questions at the end, rather than uh, taking it in between. Fine. So this is how uh, we are. This is how we are preventing the overfitting. The next thing is how to optimize the deep neural networks. So there are a couple of ways to optimize the deep neural network. Mostly, the way which is followed of the data which is nothing but your mean and that is nothing but one so mean so so when you normalize the input the output of normalization is a data distribution with uh, zero mean and unit standard deviation then we can say that that particular input is normalized if you don't normalize good fit when you want to feed that to train your neural network okay so the good fit is the perfectly balanced data where the, the mean, I mean, the center of the addition, Cartesian space should, near, should be near the mean, the data distribution, and the standard deviation should be in it. So this is one of the way to optimize your training. So there is almost 100% chance that when you train your deep neural network on normalized input, you will converge well uh, at the So this is the first thing. Then uh, we need to deal well with two problems. One is vanishing gradient and is exploding gradient. So to deal with that, we need to initialize our weights. And you can initialize those weights using some initialization techniques which are known in the market. One is HE initialization and second is Xavier initialization. So uh, how you will initialize the weights is you will take N, which is nothing but the total number of uh, neurons in the hidden layer. Okay, that will be N. And then you will uh, basically take one upon N raised to uh, B, okay, and then you will calculate square root of that. So this is how you will get the sample uh, seed point to initialize your number. Okay, so if you apply Xavier initialization rather than uh, random initialization to for your weights, there is high chance that you will avoid vanishing gradient problem and exploding gradient problem, which is because of the result of the exponentially increase uh, uh, of the values as a result of weights and uh, input multiplication. That is also uh, one of the way to, to optimize your training process. 
Second, uh, one of the important uh, technique to optimize your training process is perform gradient checking. So for every back backdrop, when you are calculating the gradient, so what is basically a gradient? So, uh, so gradient in regular mathematics term, it is derivative, okay? And when I will calculate derivative of x axis, it is zero. And when I calculate derivative of y axis, it is one. And something in between, okay, 45 angle or 30 angle, it is between zero and one. What deep neural network expect is derivative should always be greater than zero and should be lesser than or equal to one. Okay. So in gradient checking, you will be checking for every backdrop that whether your gradient, which you are calculating for every hidden layer is between zero and one. And if answer to that is yes, go ahead and apply the training process. The time when your gradient equals to zero, which says that there is nothing to learn in the, in the data, right? Then you can stop. When your gradient is somewhere near to one, there it means that there is everything to learn, which means that you need to extend your training cycles to more numbers, okay? So this is how you will set up your, uh, your infrastructure, your experiments, uh, your architecture, and this is how you will set these tuners so that you can able to optimize your training process. Okay. Now, the, the other thing about optimizing deep neural network is we have to use minimatch gradient descent. Okay. So there are a couple of ways. I mean, one is stochastic gradient descent. Second is mini batch gradient descent. And second, third is gra standard gradient descent. Okay. So the difference between these is in case of stochastic gradient descent for every input, what you are doing is you are calculating the uh, cost and then you are changing the weights as a result of back propagation. And then once those things are done, you are feeding the next clamp, okay, in the training cycle. This is stochastic. Standard gradient descent is you will feed all the samples in the training data. You will calculate loss function for every sample. You will take average of the loss across all the samples in the training data. And then that average cost function you will feed back using back propagation. That is, uh, I would say, uh, gradient descent standard gradient descent. And something which is mini batch gradient descent, you are not taking sample size as one or sample size as n, but you are taking sample size something in between, which is let's like say 100. And then you are calculating the cost for every 100. So if you see the graph, uh, the graph for standard gradient descent is more smoother. You can see that graph where the function is smoothly uh, decreased if you increase the number of iterations, but it takes more time because for every 100, sorry, for every n, you need to do that. Uh, in mini batch, uh, what you do, sorry, in stochastic, what you do is you do that for every every sample. So the the spikes are huge, ups and downs are huge because every sample you are calculating the cost, and computationally it's not a good way to do that. And the third way is mini batch gradient descent, where you are keeping some reasonable size, 100 or 200, if the, I mean, if the n is 10,000. And then you are calculating that. So you will reach to the local minimum very fast, faster than the stochastic. And uh, the time which is taken using mini batch gradient descent is also lesser if you compare that with standard gradients. So time perspective point of view, when you are training deep neural networks, thousand number of times, these small, small improvements makes more sense. So this is one way to optimize, okay? Then second way of optimizing these algorithms is uh, make some modifications in the gradient descents 
and introduce momentum into that. Okay, so momentum is uh, is a, a magnitude which allows you to take uh, higher step size. Uh, that is based on um, the 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 gradient slope. So if the gradient slope is smaller, then you can take higher step size, and the gradient slope is higher, then you can take smaller step size. Okay. So this is introduced uh, using by adding some uh, beta factor, and that is nothing but gradient descent with momentum. Again, it will reduce some uh, time to reach to the local minimum. And again, one more, uh, I mean, improvement in the gradient descent with momentum is RMS plot root mean square. So what we are doing is just we are root mean squaring the weights and uh, that helps to, to reduce the fluctuations uh, in the given uh, WB space. Okay, so, so using root mean square operation, we, we reduce those fluctuations to a more smoother fluctuations, which allows us to converge well. So this is also one way of optimizing the, the deep neural network. The one which is mostly used by everyone nowadays when they want to optimize uh, deep neural network is Adam optimization, which is uh, the, the good points of momentum, gradient descent momentum, and I mean the pace, and the good point from RMS prop is to smoothening those fluctuations. These two are taken together, and the combo of these two is nothing but your Adam optimizer. Okay, so uh, mostly when you want to optimize your algorithm, uh, you want to minimize your cost function that too in minimum number of cycles that is achieved using random optimizations as a de facto step. Nowadays, again, one more new thing is coming in optimizing these deep neural networks is learning rate DK. So DK the learning rate based on something, okay. So uh, what is that something? So learning rate is nothing but at the step size at which we want to evaluate the performance, the error, and then we want to compare that with the previous step size. And then if it is lesser, we want to go on the same direction. Okay, this is learning, isn't it? Same, I mean, in the human terminology also, we are using learning means what? Something we learn, if it helps us that, yes, this helps me to learn, we go in the same direction to learn more. That is the case. So, so when you will take this step size, and if you take the constant step size, as you go towards the local minima, there is a chance that because of the slopey nature near to the local minima, when the error function is very, very small, you may skip that local minima, if you use the fixed learning rate, okay? This is first point. And the second point is, if you're using fixed learning rate, uh, there is high chance that you are not taking into account the, the gradient of the, the error uh, with respect to the weight, okay? So to avoid these two points, what people started adopting is based on the gradient, they will reduce the, the learning rate. So moreover, learning rate will be higher when your slope is nonlinear. And I mean, slope is vertical, okay? And when your slope started becoming horizontal, your learning rate become, becomes small. So that mostly you could able to meet the local minima where you, the error is the small, okay? So these are some of the uh, optimal approaches which are available in the market. Now, when you optimized the approach, the algorithm, the deep neural network, still you are not getting the performance, okay? Then you should start with tuning the hyperparameters. So which hyperparameters are there? Couple of hyperparameters we already 
have discussed. So what should be the flow? What should be the importance? So uh, which hyperparameter I should take on priority, which has higher impact on optimization? So this is the list. So the most important hyperparameter to tune is learning rate. After that, number of hidden units, number of neurons in the hidden layer. After that, what is your mini batch size? After that, your momentum, which you take, then number of hidden layers, and then learning rate TK. Okay, so this should be the priority index, supposed to be followed. If we want to optimize the performance of the architecture. Okay, all right. So when you would like to infer from the given solution space, let's say in case of classical machine learning problems, what these machine learning models do is they apply some grid search, okay? And uh, uh, in that grid search, they will try to attempt mostly every solution, sub-solution, and then they want to pick the one which is best. But in deep neural network, we don't uh, follow this type of policy. The reason being the huge sample space which is available, okay? So what we want to do is we want to uh, basically uh, take some random sampling or we want to pick some random area and from area as a starting seed point, we want to check where we can get the optimal solution blindly, okay? And through a brute force approach, we can able to achieve that by chance. And that by chance can be converged to a more deterministic way by improving the hyperparameters, by setting some optimizations, and by increasing the number of training sets. So moreover, that brute force approach, which helps you to get the optimal solution by chance, can be converged into a deterministic approach where you know where is the solution is achievable through this optimization and hyperparameter tuning. Okay, so yeah, this is what uh, is all about when we do hyperparameter. Okay. Now, the next one. Now, once we understood that uh, these hyperparameters and everything are uh, tuned and we set up uh, correct architecture for our problem statement in hand. Now, our goal is to structure our deep, learn, deep, deep learning projects. So how to structure deep learning projects? One is uh, setting up the goal, right? So the goal is how much accuracy you want. So let us say you will say that I am expecting 98% of accuracy. Okay. which everybody is expecting, which is wrong. So the correct way of assessing that what should be our goal is take two things. One is Turing test and second is Bayesian benchmark. So Turing test and Bayesian benchmark are the proven ways to know what is maximally possible to a human expert. So let us take example that you want to develop a, a deep learning solution for uh, detecting tumors in the uh, X-ray images. Okay. Now you have 10,000 such images where in some images there is a tumor and in some images there is no tumor. And uh, you are PhD guy set up the objective function that we want 99% accuracy. Okay, so is it correct? We will we will 
try to get final concluding remark on this once I cover the next part. Okay. So what I will do is I will take these 1000 images and uh, we'll go to a radiologist who has proven experience, let's say of 20 plus years, and then we'll give him this, and then we'll ask him, can you please tell me that how many images are there where there is a tumor and the remaining where there is no tumor? So let us say you have the ground truth already with you that out of 1000 images, 600 images, there are tumors and 400 images, there are no tumors. And what that person told you after going to each and every image that there are, let us say, 500 images where there are tumors and there are 500 images where there is no tumor. Okay. So, so the false positive is, number of false positives are very high in this case. But you can set up a hypothesis that something which the human intelligence can able to achieve is let us say 90%, why I should expect my deep neural network to give as 99%. So you should set up your Bayesian benchmark to 90%. And you should compare your performance to that 90%. As 100%. So I will keep that 90% as 100%. And then if my uh, neural network, deep neural network predicts with the 90% uh, error rate, then I mean 90% error rate, I'm saying 90% accuracy, it's 100%. And if it is giving 80%, then it's 90%. So the relative margin, if you see, it's just 10% between what Bayesian benchmark is recommending and what is achieved by deep neural network. Okay, so this is how you should set up your goal. Once you set up your goal, you need to set up your development and test sets. It's very important if you want to achieve the best performance, you should not open up test set in any chance because if you provide access to your train model, a test set, it will be it will be visible to the model, and then model uh, uh, already know that what will be my test set, and uh, then the human expert will try to make the modifications of the model so that it, it will try to more over tune the model towards the test data set, and you will get highest accuracy on the test data set, which is not something practical, right? It happened because, uh, I mean, it happened because humans are given access with the test data set. So in industry, we follow a practice where we don't allow a single point access of any test data set, okay? So we allow data scientists to get the chain and get the validation. And the time when you submit the model to us, even we also don't see the test data set and we directly see the performance of the uh, model. Okay, So that much of care, you need to make sure that your test data set should be so much secure. Okay, this is, uh, this is about, I mean, setting up the environment for development and test set. The, the other thing which is more crucial when you are setting up the environment. Okay. Uh, let me check. Oh. Fine. Fine. So the other information about uh, setting up the development and test set is, uh, am I more concerned about the distribution? So let us let me give you an example so that you understand. One fine day, let us say, what you did is uh, you completed your PhD in deep learning, and uh, 
that day you told your uh, wife or your husband that uh, today I completed my deep learning, deep learning uh, completed my PhD in deep learning, and uh, now I'm very very happy. So, uh, so your uh, husband he told you that uh, that's really great. Uh, can we build one deep learning app for a uh, simple application because we have a cat in our house so let us build one small app we will install that app and i want to check your knowledge that when i will use that app and when i will click the photo it should say that there is a cat okay so you said that yes that's perfectly all right i know everything in this now and let us build that app. So what you did is you collected the images, cat images from the internet because you want to make sure to make your husband or wife very, very happy that you know deep learning. You collected around 50,000 cat images from the internet. And then you take 100 deep neural network, I mean, the convolutional neural network, and then you trained it using optimization and uh, using everything, right? So you got 99% accuracy. And then you, I mean, you deploy that app, uh, you, you use some UI UX technique like React.js and something, Node.js, and then you build app, and then you launch that. And you took around 10 days to do that. And after that, you came to home and you told your wife that, uh, hey, I, I develop this deep learning application. Can you please download from your Play Store and use that? So she uh, uh, downloaded that, she installed that, and there was cat in the house uh, sitting on the table, and uh, your wife took the picture. And the time when she took the picture, immediately the label which was shown is there is no cat in the image. Then she thought that it's enough. You did enough. Uh, I mean, you wasted your enough time in PhD, and still you are not able to achieve the performance. You should help me in the kitchen now. So this is the regular scenario in deep learning. I'm not joking. This is how things are working. So you thought that, uh, yeah, this is something uh, I was not expecting, and why it has happened, right? So when you asked it to uh, someone who is expert, really expert into that, he will give you the answer like this. So the answer is when you selected your images, those images were picked from internet, which are pre-processed high dimensional images, which are processed such that it will give better appearance and better uh, I mean, customer satisfaction, okay? But you train your model onto those type of images and now the test image is something which you have taken from your home. The camera is let's say 10 megapixel, the environment is at your home and the most riskiest part is when when you collect those cat images online, mostly those cats are from US or some developed countries. They are fat cats and developed cats, okay? Our cats are, I mean, they, they are slim and trim type of cats. So, uh, so a lot of changes are there, distribution perspective point of view, which uh, most uh, probably are the reasons which failed your deep recognition app. So the, the point of concern in this case is how you are picking your development and test set is very, very important, okay? So when you are picking your data from US, UK and Europe, and you are applying that data in India, it's of no use. Another example for that is uh, sometime back I heard that uh, Tesla is going to start their uh, operations in India uh, by 2021. So uh, the, 
uh, the Tesla, the basic model, I mean, uh, how the Tesla car is developed is in, in the front uh, portion of the car, they basically kept the computers and that computer is connected with more than 10,000 sensors and the camera. That camera, when that car is running on the road, is collecting the images and the sensors are also collecting the data. And then it is feeded to the computer, which is placed on the car. And then that deep neural network will process all these inputs and predict something. And uh, uh, it will then activate the actuators, which will autonomously press the brakes or turn your car to the right or left based on what are the signals and everything, right? So now when they train it in the US, you, you can imagine that US people, they usually follow rules, okay? So if there is a red signal, it is expected that pedestrian should stop by the road and he should allow cars to go. And once the signal is green, they should pass. But since I'm from Pune, I usually get access of many type of such people who are using their hands still to stop the car if there is a green signal, right? So imagine that when Tesla will start their operations where the deep neural network is trained, where if the signal is green, go. And in Pune, when there are a lot of people who are using their hands and not the signals, you can imagine a lot many accidents will happen. So the training happened in US and testing and operations in India is never going to work, okay? So you need to develop your own Tesla car or own Tata Motors car, autonomous car, which is trained on the local data. So that is also one of the important factor when you want to structure your deep uh, learning projects. And uh, I mean, the severity of the life, the severity of the consequences is huge when you use deep learning uh, in healthcare, deep learning in uh, automobiles. Okay. So make sure that if you are doing something on those lines, uh, you need to make sure that you are selecting proper development and test sets so that you can rely on those tests, basically. Next thing is about uh, human level performance, which I already told you that uh, rather than comparing the accuracy of your model to 100 as a benchmark, you need, you need to compare the accuracy of the model to Bayesian uh, optimal error, where Bayesian optimal error is calculated by what max can be achievable by humans. Okay. So uh, that's how you can, uh, you can evaluate the performance. Then the second, the third thing which you need to what is human error, what is training error, and what is development error, okay? So when you are taking into account human error, you can, there is one more word, which is called as avoidable bias. That avoidable bias is if uh, there is enough bias with human performance, then uh, not to worry on the bias which gets introduced in training error. So that we can say that we can avoid that bias because we are assuming that human error is quite enough, so not to worry on the bias which happened at the training uh, cycle. Okay, so uh, I mean, just on the slide we are we are just discussing couple. I mean, three to four or four to five techniques, but uh, such things, if I would like to disclose and I would like to explain in length, then there are twenty plus to thirty plus different mechanisms and techniques which we need to take into account when we want to deal with a particular solution and particular situation in structuring the machine learning project or deep learning project, okay? So, yeah. The last uh, way, uh, the most effective way to deal with the errors that you, you applied all hyperparameters, you apply all set of optimizations and uh, Again, uh, you applied 
uh, all type of techniques to reduce the errors, but still you cannot reduce the errors. So then in this case, the only thing which will help you is MS Excel. So you need to create an Excel sheet. In that Excel sheet, you need to create uh, the, the headers like uh, you can say the name of the of the example, then uh, the properties in that image, the type of cat, uh, what you think is missing in the in the image, what are your observations, and all those things you will place, okay, and then you will pick the vertical where you got maximum number of entries or maximum number of errors, and then those. Uh, observations you will see and you will try to use some algorithm or manual solution to avoid that particular problem okay so this type of error analysis is a common practice in industry uh, when we work on uh, real time real time projects okay so this is how we do uh, error analysis in uh, when when everything went wrong <clears throat> so the next uh, thing is about uh, the mismatch between train and development or test data. Okay, so so when let us say when you split the data into train, development, and test for your deep neural network uh, architecture, and it it I mean that particular partitioning introduces huge error as output okay so there are a couple of ways to sort this particular case out one is rather than taking the fix uh, uh, i would say partitions of train development and test what you can do is you can take a random shuffling right so uh, for every training cycle you will take random shuffling of train test train and validation so uh, what will happen is that will give almost uniform distribution of training and validation data across uh, the the training cycles okay which helps you to reduce the validation error and most probably your model will generalize well on the test data okay so that is one of the way uh, which is uh, random shuffling to avoid the mismatch between training versus development and test. Okay, so uh, the second most important way once uh, you you adopted this random shuffling way is understanding the data mismatch. So how you are going to understand that data mismatch? For that, uh, you basically need some uh, pre-processing techniques, pre-processing algorithms, which basically helps you to derive, to derive the statistical significance, correlation, covariance, and uh, you can say the ED analysis from the data. And once you are sure enough that, uh, yes, the distributions, the, the correlations, the eigenvectors, uh, the variance, all these things are set and they are consistent across train development and test. Okay, then most probably you can able to do that. Now you will say that why this is important because this is a common practice in machine learning. Though it is a common practice in machine learning, when I saw different projects which academicians are doing, mostly they don't have that much of data, okay, which is required. So in, in a situation when you have a limited amount of data, then you need to apply a lot of pre-processing and data normalization, okay? When the amount of data or volume of data is somewhere exceeding, uh, you can say uh, 10,000 GB or uh, one TB or two, two petabytes of data or exabytes of data, and continuously you are grabbing those scale of data from the APIs, and then you are feeding that into real time. In those industrial environments, uh, this is something uh, not needed that you need to apply too much pre-processing onto that. But if amount of data is huge enough, you can directly feed the data to your uh, neural network and no worries about pre-processing. Yeah. 
One more interesting fact about deep learning is transfer learning. So this is something that I, I learned deep neural network and I'm passing on that information and knowledge to you. This is called as transfer learning. So rather than uh, training your neural network from scratch every time, you please check, is there someone in market who open sourced their deep neural networks or pre-trained architectures on the similar type of data? So let us say you are building a cat classifier. What you will do? You will search online, cat classifier using deep learning. So you will get some medium articles, okay? Then you will see what he has done. And you found that he have given the link to, your, to the GitHub. So you will go there and you will see, oh, he trained his CNN onto cats, cat, cat type of images. Then you will see what type of images are there. Luckily he is Indian and you are also Indian. So you will see that he collected the cat images from let's say uh, Chennai and you have the cat images from Pune, all right. So you see that by randomly verifying some cat images, you found that mostly the cats are same. So you can, what you can do is once someone trained the neural network, uh, they found the weight values, okay. So those weight values are the weight values, which if applied to cat image, will give the classification label cat with 99% accuracy. This is what that person achieved. Now what you can do is on your input data, you can, because when someone train the model, he will say model.save, and he will save that model into .pickle file. So that dot .pickle file contains the configuration and the, the weights, okay? Because configuration, he decided that how many layers, how many neurons, what should be the nonlinear activation function, was are the configuration. So that saved model, you need to download and you need to load onto your current grid. Once you load that, run into Jupyter notebook, and rather than giving a single training cycle, you can directly feed your image to that pre-trained architecture and straight away, it will predict there is a cat. This way of doing is called as transfer learning. So we are transferring the learning from one application to another application. Okay, so uh, what basically we are transferring is we are transferring uh, the weights. So that is nothing but learning. So you can imagine your case that what is learning? So when I see TV, I usually in my early days when uh, in my childhood, when I see, let us say a TV, I would have said that it is a slate because it, because it looks like a slate. But then my father told me that, no, no, this is not slate. See, I am starting my TV, starting the TV. And you can see something, some, some channels, right? So, so I started reducing the weights. That if I see something like this, where there are display and there is something shown on the on the display, I will provide higher weights to TV as a level. Okay. And when I see some similar type of structure where someone is writing using cell, I will give higher weights to a label which is called as slate. So this is what my experience is. Now already that pre-trained architecture got an experience and that experience is stored in the weights. Those weights, if you use as is in your architecture, you can directly use that rather than doing the training, you can directly test. This type of methodology is called as transfer learning. It avoids uh, your cost on the infrastructure, your cost on the data collection, your cost on the time, and whatever best practices are adopted, those best practices you will get uh, in your hand to utilize that. Okay, so 
this is nothing but transfer learning. So yeah, the next type of uh, learning which multitask learning. Okay. So what is multitask learning? Multitask learning is at the same time I want to label the pedestrian, the car, the road, the trees, the the stones on the road, the wild animals on the road, right? So everything, okay? So that type of learning is called as multitask learning where you need to make a change in the last layer. So the last layer, the number of dimensions, the number of neurons in last layer will be uh, the number of classes you want to detect, okay? So uh, let us say the number of classes you want to detect for your car, you want to de develop an autonomous car. So the classes are uh, signals. So green, yellow, and red. Then uh, zebra crossing, then pedestrian. Then uh, you can say uh, the other cars, right? Let's say these six uh, classes are there. So the output dimension will be six and your deep neural network will provide you six probabilities, okay? And you will have a one hot encoding vector at the end, which is your ground truth, which tells one to the, the class which is available in the image and zero for the remaining one. And then you will calculate the softmax loss for the whole, and then you will back propagate. And same you will do for every class which you want to detect. So this type of learning, where you want to learn more than one class in, an, in a given input is called as multitask learning. So that multitask learning can be implemented by making some slight changes in the cost function. So the cost function will become now one upon M. So average across all M examples, some overall M. If the number of classes are four, then some over four. So Y log Y hat plus one minus Y log one minus Y hat. Okay, so that one, so that loss you are calculating for some over all four classes. So you are calculating that loss for every four classes and the objective function is to minimize the whole loss across all the classes and across all the examples. It means when you minimize that whole loss, you can able to uh, detect any object uh, out of this four with highest accuracy. Okay, yeah. So this is called as multitask learning. And the last one is end-to-end -end learning where we won't make any change in, in between. So there is no feature engineering in between. We will directly provide the input and we are expecting the output. So that is something called as end-to-end -end learning, which uh, nowadays also called as ATO ML or ATO deep learning, okay? So these are some of the variants which are available in the market if you want to use them to do your task, okay? So I think, this is 350. Okay, so let me see. Okay. Uh, any questions? Let me take some five, 10 minutes break on questions and then we will continue. Chaya, madam, what is the procedure? Ask questions uh, if the students are have, participants are having any questions, and we will answer that question. The, the most important thing is in two situations, there will be questions. The one is if you understand everything or you don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm expecting questions. Yeah. Just reading, uh, already have if any a participants. <coughs> Any questions? Can put in Good afternoon. Uh, may I? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, sir. The session was very nice. Thanks. Um, sir, basically, I come from mechanical background, so I am a beginner of uh, beginner in this domain. Hmm. So um, my question is: Is data augmentation for statistical features is possible? Uh, statistical features, what do you want to refer at? 
mean mode median skewness kurtosis these are the statistical features which come in the numerical format number format so uh, not in the image format um, just that we have discussed uh, regarding cnn that image we take yes so uh, instead of image sensor if we have a data in the form of num numbers mm. that are statistical features mean mode mania skewness kurtosis etc so is the data augmentation is possible for statistical features yes it's possible so how which method which neural network or what so for that you need to uh, understand uh, gan that is generative adversarial network which is one of the most advanced network which helps you to uh, understand the inner embeddings of the distributions let's say you are saying that in in terms of numbers and then it will give you some approximations and those approximations you can treat as one more sample of the data so you need to learn uh, gan okay 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 so gan is possible with what python excel yeah this is the extended i mean more advanced uh, neural network uh, generative adversarial neural network whose task is basically understanding the uh the inner approximations in the data and then uh, represent that onto some other dimensions which you expect it want to so it is a python based deep neural network you can even there is a package available you can directly use that and uh, annotate your data okay sir okay thank you thank you so much thanks someone is doing phd in deep learning yes sir okay you are doing phd yes sir oh, thank you sir your voice is not audible ma'am i think um uh, i think and if you check chat okay Uh, all right it seems nobody understood deep learning <laughs> that's why there are no questions fine so uh, <laughs> fine see the point is this topic is is really vast uh, every day there are more than uh, 100 plus research papers released and uh, i'm trying to keep myself on that pace by reading at least one to two but uh, that that's the only way you can you can keep yourself consistent on 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 the track but this is amazing that every day there are uh, extensions advances modifications are going on and uh, the 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 topic or uh, the concepts which you are learning this but if you want to really get into deep learning i think the only way is reading the research papers every day and understanding what's going on how researchers are making modifications uh and uh, using that small modifications in the maths what is achievable what is not achievable so once you do that for for an year then you can set up the hypothesis that yes i understood the way things are going so you can put up your own theory this is how things should go rather than having in the disjoint way that someone is telling you to do this and you are doing that without knowing why you are doing and what you are doing right so yeah so this is uh, expected in deep learning i don't know about other domains but deep learning expects this type of uh, working okay so yeah uh, so it's almost 4 whether audience is still ready to uh, to go with for half an hour or should we quit can 
your voice is not audible i don't know uh, uh, so mammogram classification so there is one question which are defined models in suitable for mammogram classification so uh, you need to check uh, the the most important uh, source where you can check these pretrained architecture is there is neural network search engine implemented by mit uh, so you can go onto that website and if you check that neural network for mammogram it will give you the github where that pretrained architecture available you can download that as a open source and you can directly use that so mit have given neural network search uh, facility where it only enables you to search the neural networks for your task across all the open source neural networks available on the globe yeah uh you need to check i'm not i mean uh, let me search that but if you if you search on google neural search then uh, or neural network search uh, website it will you will get that link yeah all right so i think that three and half hour is something uh, it's fine to stop and uh, uh, whatever i explained if you have any questions uh you can take some different channel maybe the whatsapp where you can ask the questions and uh i will try to answer that uh but mostly i have given you enough idea i hope you all have understood uh these topics yeah thank you from my side thanks yeah chai ma'am over to you you are not audible ma'am i am trying to predict what you can say <laughs> as a deep neural network so i will assume that when you stop your talk is over yeah so so this i kept only for this type of queries you can ask your queries on to uh, uh, this email id deep intuition one at the red gmail dot com only for student queries yeah thank you no your voice is not audible ma'am it's fine We'll have the session. Yes, now it's audible. Second, not audible. I think session coordinator is keeping it on mute. Yes, now it's audible. Yes. Am I audible now, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, students. Thanks.